and in the future. Tonight we have a treat. He's a captain in the Marine Corps, so I got to be really careful when I get this right. Michael Masters is the National Director and CEO of Secure Community Network. And he's going to tell us about our own Iron Dome. How do we protect ourselves? How does his organization help the Jewish community in this country protect ourselves? He's responsible for the overall leadership operation and growth of the official safety and security organization, the Secure Community Network for the Jewish community in North America. He's an appointee of the U.S. Secretary of Homeland Security to the Federal Homeland Security Advisory Council and also the Faith-Based Advisory Council and serves on the executive board of the FBI Chicago Joint Terrorism Task Force. He was executive director of the Department of Homeland Security and Man an Emergency Management for Cook County, Illinois, Chicago, chief of staff of the Chicago Police Department, and assistant to the former mayor of the city of Chicago. Most of you remember a guy named Richard Daly. He served as a commission officer of the United States Marine Corps as well. On the other side of this intellectually, he's a Harry Truman Scholar and Gates Cambridge Trust Scholar. He holds a bachelor's degree from University of Michigan, NCAA football team. A master's degree in international relations from Cambridge, and a Juris Doctor is a lawyer from Harvard Law School which used to be a really important law school, <laughs> where he served as managing editor of the Harvard International Law Journal. He's a recognized expert on issues to homeland and national security, terrorism, law enforcement, what's left of it in this country, anti-Semitism, and targeted violence. And as testified, served as an expert panelist and appears as a guest speaker before the U.S. Congress and interagency task forces. Will you please welcome Captain Michael Master. It's been a while since anyone's referred to me as Captain. Uh, but thank you very much. My mother would have been delighted at the introduction, so I'm very appreciative. Um, thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure. I am, uh, as I stand in these beautiful surroundings, I am thinking back to two weeks ago yesterday when I stood on what is recognized as hollow ground for us as a Jewish community. I stood on the site of where for 160 years, a vibrant symbol of Jewish life existed, a place that hosted bar mitzvahs and weddings, funerals and rites of passage, the Tree of Life Synagogue. The building that existed and stood for generations is no longer there. It has been deconstructed and dismantled, taken down in the wake of the terror attack of October 27, 2018. I was there two weeks ago yesterday for the groundbreaking, the groundbreaking of a new building that will rise up in its place to stand as a symbol against hate and strength for our community. Rabbi Jeffrey Myers, who, Rabbi Jeffrey Myers, who left the building that day, stayed in the building, called 911 and let law enforcement know where the offender was, said, two weeks ago, evil did not win. Evil will not drive us from our home. We will not let it. That only works though, if we don't let evil drive us from our homes. From our homes like Tree of Life, from our home like this Chabad, this JCC, and Jewish life around the United States. That is our choice to make, no one else's. During that ceremony, 
I couldn't help but think his ground was broken the many times I'd been to that facility. Inside the facility to see the ground broken. But in the inside, it was broken because in the wake of the attack, our Hevra Kadisha had to dig up the floor and dismantle the walls so that our relatives, our family members, our community could be buried whole. Two weeks ago, it was broken so that we could erect something new. And at the end of that ceremony, the families and the victims, individuals like Andrea Wedner and Audrey Glickman and Steve Weiss, people who I've come to know and love, stood up on stage and they broke glass. They broke glass that will be turned into the mezuzot that will adorn the new building. And I think that's particularly poignant for us as communities and members of our community around the country ask the question, is it safe to be Jewish? Is it safe to hang mezuzot from our homes? Those that were most directly impacted by the worst terror attack on our community in this country, the Jewish victims and families at Tree of Life are making new mezuzot to hang on their building. And surely, if they can do that, if they are willing to do that, then all of us should be strong enough as a community to stand up and say, we will make the same exact choice. And that is our choice to make. As we stand here today and across our community, the question is, what will our legacy be? What will we impart to our future generations? Will we send the message that we have to take the mezuzot off of our home? That we have to hide our stars of David? Or will we send another message? That when we say never again, we mean it. And we truly will not allow again to happen. Making that investment today is now more critical than ever before. One of the jobs of the Secure Community Network, and I'll speak a little bit about our work as a nonprofit organization, we serve as the official liaison with the FBI and Department of Homeland Security, along with federal law enforcement generally. We assess on a daily basis the threat environment we face. Just before coming here, there was a call with the National Security Council, the CIA, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence we assess that the threat environment that we are facing is the most complex and dynamic one that we have ever faced as a Jewish community and as a country in our 248 year history. Now I could stand here and talk to you at somewhat nauseating length about the threat vectors that we face and the individuals and groups from Hamas and Hezbollah and Al Qaeda the offshoots of all of those organizations, uh, neo-Nazis and supremacists. But my grandmother always taught me, when people tell you who they are, listen. So I prefer to listen. So I take it seriously in recent weeks when Iran's supreme leader vowed that the Zionist regime and Jews everywhere will be eliminated. At the same time, the Islamic State has called for the targeting of Jews, all of us here in the United States, by individuals sympathetic to what is happening to Palestinians in Gaza. This followed a pro-Al-Qaeda's magazine call for mass attacks in the United States against our community. And we have seen foiled attacks in Western Europe, Brazil, Canada, and some successful ones. An offshoot of the Islamic State attacking a concert venue in Moscow and killing 100 innocent civilians. Make no mistake, the enemies of Israel, of the Jewish community, and of America are united in their desire to visit violence upon us and to do it here at home. And they are here. And I'm not being alarmist. The arrest several weeks ago of eight Tajiks in New York intent on committing a terrorist attack with pro-Islamist leanings is an indicator of the work that is going on every single day to protect our community as Jews and our country. And the terrorists, whether state actors or individuals, are intent on reaching us. So when people tell you who they are, listen. Our job is not merely to listen, it is to act. 
And the question is, will we? And how fast are we going to do it? Now, in listening to all this, it's natural for people to be afraid and to be scared. But we don't have to be. And we also cannot live in a state of denial. Our greatest enemy as a community is not the Islamist extremist or Al-Qaeda. It is the phrase that I and every other Marine, first responder, law enforcement member has heard when we have responded to an incident. I never thought it could happen here. And yet it can. For those of you that are from Chicago or those of you that were paying attention, it can happen in a community in Highland Park, just like it can happen in Charlottesville, like it can happen in Colleyville, like it can happen in Poway. What we need to do as a community and what the work of the Secure Community Network is doing is just like in Israel, we are working to build an iron dome over the entirety of the Jewish community of North America. Because every community, every facility needs to be protected. We are not going to choose the time and place of the next incident, but we can choose our preparation. So if you think back to January 15th, of 2022 and that morning in Colleyville, Texas, of all places, a radicalized Islamist extremist walked into Congregation Beth Israel. Now, I'm not a betting person, but if you had asked me to take a bet of where a radicalized Islamist extremist would show up, the chances that I chose Congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, Texas, of all places, would not be high on my list. That individual flew from London Heathrow to JFK on December 29th, spent several days in New York City before making their way to Dallas. I don't use the names of the offenders, by the way. I refuse to give them the credit that they so desire or the notoriety. So just stick with me on that one. Thank you. And I also don't call them pro-Palestinian marches. They're pro-Hamas marches, particularly when you're using the catchphrase of a foreign designated terrorist organization. So we should get our terminology quickly straightened out. That individual traveled from New York to Dallas, illegally purchased a firearm on January 13th, and showed up at the door of Congregation Beth Israel on January 15th. For 11 hours, he held members of our community hostage. 11 hours. Now, there's very few times we can say an exact date that saved Jewish lives, but August 21st, five months before, was the day. That was the day that a member of the Fort Worth community, a guy by the name of Jim Stanton, and my board member, Danny Prescott, who's sitting here and I know well, Jim Stanton insisted that we do training in Fort Worth. But because we're building a protective shield and because we're not gonna choose the time and place of the next incident, that meant we had to do training across all of Tarrant County and Fort Worth. So all half dozen organizations had assessments done of the facilities. They had training done. They applied for federal grants. And on August 21st, when a member of the community said to our trainer, what if we don't have a gun? What if all we have is a chair? Our trainer, former member of the IDF and Memphis Police Department, nice Jewish boy from Memphis, said if all you have is a chair, you throw a chair. 11 hours into the hostage crisis, Rabbi Charlie Citroen Walker picked up a chair. The first time that that offender put down his handgun in 11 hours and he threw that chair, that gave them the precious seconds they needed to escape. And escape they did. And when the news stuck a camera in their faces and said, tell us about your rescue. So we weren't rescued, we escaped. And it was the training that did it. That is the power that we have as a community. <clears throat> Within minutes of that terrorist attack unfolding, our command center in Chicago, which is a 24 seven command center that looks like something out of CSI or the matrix, went into action. Within three minutes, we had identified the Facebook live stream that was the offender was posting on. We alerted the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, the FBI special agent in charge, Matt Tassarno, the Dallas field office was en route within minutes. At 2.30 in the afternoon, the hostage rescue team of the FBI took off from Quantico, Virginia. We were in touch with them the whole way. Part of the reason why, because nobody had blueprints of the synagogue. But our trainer, Stuart Frisch, who'd been in the building, had the blueprint in his head. So he was on the phone with the hostage rescue team, giving them the interior layout of the building. And they were in position at 9.30 at night, but they were just a little bit late. 
because the hostages decided on their own to take action in their own hands. And that is the lesson that we need to learn as a community. We have some phenomenal partners in law enforcement, phenomenal partners in other faith-based communities, but for 4,000 years, the choice we have made to survive has come down to us as a community being willing to stand together and fight for our own survival. And we have survived exodus and extermination. We have survived attempted intifada time and time again by standing together. So we can do this work together. Part of the work that is being done every single day around this country is being done by our team at the Secure Community Network, or SCN. I happen to believe it's probably one of the most impactful Jewish organizations that no one has ever heard of, and that is somewhat intentional. We like to fly somewhat under the radar. We have a team of former military, law enforcement, and intelligence professionals, over 115 that are designated and assigned around the country. Every single day, these men and women are working to build that iron dome. So sitting in Chicago, one of my good friends, Rob Vaughn, is, is sitting over here. I want to thank him for being here. Across from his office, he's got some of the best security in the world because he's got the worst threat dynamic facing his office space in the country because he's right next to us. We have a team of intelligence analysts that are working 24-7 around the clock on what we call Project RAIN. So after the attack in Pittsburgh, we created a proprietary stack of technology, since we're off the record here, I think. Yes, we're off the record. Real-time actionable intelligence network. We actually named it after Lieutenant Aldo Rain from the movie Inglorious Bastards, because the purpose of the project was to hunt bad guys that threaten our community. That facility has over 12, that stack of technology has over 12,500 centers of Jewish life cataloged in it, Every single moment, over 18,000 data feeds are flowing into that system. Surface, deep, and dark web. We are monitoring over 1,700 persons of interest. Because of the reliability of the information we provide to our federal law enforcement partners, we are the only faith-based nonprofit entity in the United States that has a direct data feed into the FBI's National Threat Operations Center. And we use it every single day. 1,619 direct threats to life that we sent to the FBI last year. Over 65% of those after October 7th. I'm gonna come back to that. What is a direct threat to life? That is not a swastika on a garbage can. It is not a poster hanging from an overpass. It is someone saying, I intend to kill Jews, and we can identify who they are, where they are, or where they intend to target. So just several months ago, we identified two individuals that were speaking with one another. One of them was based in the UK. One of them was based in Las Vegas. Within three hours, the FBI was knocking on the door of the individual in Las Vegas and placing them under arrest for supporting terrorism. And then they were charged both federally and thanks to the state of uh, Nevada's laws, they were charged with a state charge of supporting domestic terrorism as well. At the same time, we worked with the Met and our sister organization, the United Kingdom, the Community Security Trust, and with several hours, they had identified the offender in the UK. He was pictured that, or he was found that day taking pictures outside of a member of parliament's office with the alleged intention of assassinating that member of parliament within days. That time to action is what we are needing to do every single day to keep the community safe and it is why we are averaging off the record one arrest every 12 to 16 days that we can talk about with intelligence that is coming from our security director network, but also critically from all of you. So we have a phenomenal partnership here in the state of Colorado, with Jewish Colorado. I wanna recognize Renee Rockford, the CEO, president and CEO. Renee, where are you? There you are in back. Thank you. So here in Colorado, we have a team of security professionals, all former FBI agents. One of them was the FBI's longest serving undercover asset in the white Aryan nation. Undercover for over three years. They work every day to protect our community. Here in Aspen, in Vail, in Denver, every day working to do assessments, every day working with state, local, and federal law enforcement, doing training, so when we had the shooting at the yeshiva in Denver, 
It was that team that mobilized themselves. It's that team that is working when we face bomb threats here and around the country. That is the work that is happening in Jewish communities, often under the radar, that needs to happen every single day. That command center, we took in over 5,400 incident reports last year. That was a 112% increase from the year prior. 516 incident reports on our campuses, over 70% of which happened after October 6th, 7th, and that was prior to the encampments where things have degraded significantly. So every single day we're working with campus law enforcement, local and state law enforcement on our campuses. And we anticipate it's gonna get a lot worse before it gets better. We have a partnership with Hillel International. We work closely with Chabad on campus, with AEPI, with CBT, with SDT, with AE5, every single Jewish fraternity and sorority around the country. And if you have family, you have kids or grandkids, or you're an alum, get in touch with us because we need to make sure that every campus, every Jewish student is trained. We have good partnerships, but our security needs to come from within. That is the lesson that we need to learn over and over again, and we shouldn't have to learn it too many more times because it comes at the cost of Jewish life. So as we think about that threat dynamic and those incident reports and what's happening on our campus, and we think about the physical security work that needs to happen. Every Jewish facility needs to have an assessment done. You need to have a security team like you have here, sitting outside when you walk in. We need to think about the access control. And this is something that we're doing and standardizing across the country. And we don't have time to lose. Now people say, why is this important? So how many Chicagoans do I have in the room? Good bunch, okay. What did we learn in Chicago, December 1st, 1958? Our Lady of the Angels fire. It was the worst school fire in the history of the United States. A total of 92 kids and three nuns lost their lives that day. And we said as a country, we were never ever gonna let that happen again. Within 18 months, 16,500 school buildings across this country, 68% of all communities implemented new fire safety codes, safety procedures, and the modern fire drill that all of us here know. And I guarantee if there was a fire alarm, even though we are all from different places, we would get up, and as long as we don't have a George Costanza in the room that's gonna knock old people out of the way and rush to get to the door, we are all gonna do the same thing because that is how we have been socialized as a country and as a community. And if you look around, any public use building, what are you gonna see? I guarantee if you flip over the chairs, there's a UL right rating on the bottom of your chair. The wallpaper is rated for fire. The exit signs that exist in our buildings will be lasting, outlasting all of civilization. They're still gonna be blinking. Sprinkler systems. We made a choice as a country that we were never gonna allow life to be taken in that way again. That is the same choice as a community that we have to make now, today as we look at places like Pittsburgh and Poway, as we look at places like Charlottesville and Colleville, the choice for us is are we going to rise to the occasion or are we going to stick our head in the sand and deny that there is a problem? Our enemies are very clear in their intention. They don't want to debate. They are not interested in dialogue. They are interested in death. Now, we can take our bets as to whether they're gonna be successful or not, or we can stand up and say that we're not gonna allow them to win. The work that we're doing at SCN is designed to empower this community so that we can win. It is being undertaken in collaboration with our federations, with groups like our Hillels. We just announced a new camp security initiative. How many of you, before you send your kids or your grandkids or your great grandkids to camp, Ask the question, what does your security look like at your camp? How many? Raise your hands. Good, I've got two, three. Amanda's one of them because she sat through one of my threat briefings Five. before. Five? Not surprising to you. <laughs> Everyone needs to be asking that question. Just like everybody needs to be asking campus administrators, what are you doing to protect our kids? It is a forcing function. We had 440 overnight and day camps in this country that exist 
and most of the overnight camps, where do they exist? In rural America. Our camps in Western Pennsylvania are right plumb in the center of the largest concentration of supremacists and neo-Nazis that exists in the United States. The same with our Jewish camps in the Northeast. We've got a similar problem, Northwest, thank you. Similar problem in Minneapolis, North of Minneapolis. Camp Herzl has some of the best security of any camp because they recognize the threat and they invested in it. So ask the question, what are you doing? We've done the exact same thing on campuses. Are we going to accept Jewish students not being able to go to class this fall because they are afraid? Or are we gonna get up and we're gonna use our dollars and our voice to say to campus administrators, you signed up for a particular job and you're not very well qualified for the job you have now, it's incumbent upon you to protect our kids. I will share with you that our conversations with law enforcement, the only group that perhaps is more frustrated with, than us as a community is them. They are frustrated because their hands are tied, often implicitly or explicitly, from political leadership and they are prohibited from doing their jobs of enforcing the law. And people ask, how can that be on campuses? So it's very similar to what we have seen historically with sexual assault on campuses. Underreported, underinvested in, underenforced. Why? Because it impacts donor dollars, the ability to secure donor dollars, and it impacts admission rates. What campus administrator wants their audience to think that anti-Semitism is running riot on campuses? So what's the easier solution to address it or deny that it exists? And in the process, who's suffering? Jewish students. I was so proud this summer, we had an intern in our office, a young man by the name of Dylan Mann. Now, for many of you may not recognize the name, but if you think back to the protests at Tulane, and that one young man that went into the crowd when the pro-Hamas agitators tried to rip down an Israeli flag and he prevented them from doing it, that was Dylan Mann. He got a broken nose and a whole lot of support from our community. And he just completed his internship with us at SCN, and he's now in Israel, and he's thinking about a career in the FBI. That is the difference. We stand with our community, and we have to continue to stand together as our community for the next generation and generations to come. We can make a difference. When I think back to Pittsburgh, you think back to that morning of October 27th, 2018, that day, we had 11 members of our community massacred. We didn't lose them, they were taken from us. But the work that happened beforehand is what can make the difference between life or death. Because the after action report from the FBI said if it weren't for the work that the Jewish community did, the investment that was made in security, the death toll would have been three or four times higher. Less than eight weeks before the attack, a former FBI agent by the name of Brad Rossini, who was hired by the Jewish Federation in Pittsburgh to be their security director, spent the day at Tree of Life. Four things happened that day. One, Brad, who looks a little bit like he could play for the Pittsburgh Steelers, he's a gigantic Italian Catholic guy with a bald head, got into an argument with Rabbi Myers. Now, I don't usually recommend getting into an argument with a rabbi as a strategy, but he got into an argument with the rabbi. And he said, Rabbi, somebody here needs to be able to call 911 if there's an emergency. And the rabbi said, Brad, I'll do respect. I'm Shomer Shabbos. I don't carry, we don't use electronics. Brad, thanks to his very strong Catholic education, pulled out the concept, Rabbi, you have an obligation. It's called Pekuach Nefesh. You have a halakhic obligation. Brad had spent some time learning about our community. And Rabbi Meyer said, you're right. From that day on, September 5th, Rabbi Myers carried his cell phone. And when Rabbi Myers was standing on the bima and the gunfire started, he was the first person that called 911. And he got the Pittsburgh Police Department there in under 90 seconds. Secondly, Brad cleared all the emergency exits. So next time you go into a Jewish facility, anywhere you go, Look at the emergency exits. We have a phenomenal fondness as a community for using them as storage areas. <laughs> they are not the place to put the chairs from the mitzvah or the tables from the wedding that we didn't quite get to. 
He cleared all three emergency exits, every single one of which was used on the day of the attack for people to get out. Third, he had law enforcement in the building through the facility. They knew what the interior layout was. They got into an 89 minute gun battle with the offender. 89 minutes. Thousands of rounds of ammunition were exchanged. Four Pittsburgh police officers were injured. One of them is on his 18th surgery. This is a highly professional, adept enemy that we are confronting. But they knew the floor plan and it helped them isolate the offender and present greater life shed. And a side story, and I, I truly believe that we get some help from above. Three out of four Saturdays, there was a Hebrew school that took place with 26 kids. Three out of four. That Saturday was the one where they weren't in the classroom. The classroom that the offender holed up in for that 89 minute gun battle. Sometimes we get good, sometimes we get lucky, and sometimes we have some help. But it takes all of us doing our part. Lastly, Brad did the training. Every single member of the synagogue that was there that day that went through training survived with one exception, our doctor. He told Brad during the training, he said, Brad, I feel like if something happens, I'm gonna to have to stay. He got out and he went back in and that's when he was killed. But this is the difference. This is the level of empowerment and so when I stand in Squirrel Hill and I see Andrea Wedner and Audrey Blickman and Steve Weiss and they give me a hug and they say thank you, they're not saying thank you to me. They are saying thank you to this amazing community, all of us, that comes together to make the investment to do security and keep the community safe. So I say on their behalf, thank you for being here for making that investment. We've got to do more of this work though. I have stood in far too many places that have been desecrated. Our sacred space is violated. Pittsburgh, Poway, Charlottesville, Collierville. What is it gonna take for us to say never again truly? That is the choice that we have to make. We have made that choice for 4,000 years, but I need each and every one of you involved actively in making that choice with us, to get trained, to be empowered, to ask the question, to donate your time or your resources to get this work done so that every Jewish community can be protected because we are not gonna choose the time and the place of the next incident, but we can choose our preparation. Our story as a people is one of Exodus, right? From the first times, Egypt, Spain, Europe, we have been kicked out of almost every place we have been. It is our history. We cannot allow it to be our future. We need to stand up and stand strong and tell our adversaries that we are not going anywhere. And I would challenge anyone that thinks that they are gonna stop at tearing down an Israeli flag at Tulane or burning an American flag on Columbia's campus. They are not gonna stop there. They will not be happy or satisfied till they tear the Israeli flag off the Knesset and the American flag off of our US Capitol. This is an existential threat, not just to our community, but to this Republic and American democracy. And we are the tip of the spear. And all of us need to understand that. And my only hope is that other communities will understand that as well and join us in the fight. But for now, as it has been for thousands of years, we need to stand strong and we need to let them know that we are not going anywhere. Thank you very much. Okay, we have, oh, is this on? Can you hear me? Hi, we have time for a couple of questions. Oh, we have one right here. Um, I would just ask that you keep it to an actual question and not a uh, speech. Thank you. Thank you for your sweet presentation. Are you aware of the work done by Clarion uh, Corporation? Yes, I am aware of how they speak Arabic and hunt through 
the internet and identify people that the FBI goes after them. Yalla. Amazing work. Yes. <laughs> we have I can answer in Arabic, but I'll answer in English. Uh, yes, we are. there are any number of great organizations out doing work in the community. Um, and I would say to all of us as a community, and I say this as a parent and as a member of the community, what we need to do is challenge organizations to work together. Clarion is a good partner. We have others as well that we partner with on a regular basis to share intelligence and information. I've served in law enforcement for 20 years, right? So I firmly recognize the pre-9-11 mindset. What we have in our community right now, and this is not directly related to the group that you mentioned, who I think does great work, we have far too many entities that are trying to do it on their own for credit or claim rather than coordination. That creates an intelligence and information sharing gap that our enemies are only all too willing to take advantage of. So what I would suggest to all of us, one of the things that we have to do as a community is truly force collaboration and coordination. There are far too many adversaries Right, so when I tell you that we're, we referred 1,600 over to the FBI last year, we're up to over 800 this year alone. And those are direct threats to life, as I mentioned. We have members of our team that serve the Behavioral Analysis Unit of the FBI. For anyone that has seen the show Mindhunters on Netflix, it's actually quite good. They are profilers. We are looking to find the most violent adversaries against the community. But there are many more out there. And so we all have to work together to make sure that we are pulling wars in the same direction. And the group that you just mentioned is one of those that we work with. My opinion is the ADL should be eliminated and you should be re-employed because they are so ineffective. Donate to your group, not the ADL. I'll take the donate to our group part of that and go with that. How about, <laughs> thank you. Hi there, and thank you for being here. And I'll just say that in Houston, we've seen firsthand what having a, a security director that was a former FBI agent for 27 years has done in terms of our security. So thank you for all the work you're doing. I'm curious about your thoughts on kind of the calibration of our threat detection systems psychologically. You know, you, you described that we want to get away from this. I never thought it could happen here. I fear the risk is we get to a place where it's everyone's out to get us. There's an enemy around every corner, under every rock's a Nazi. And the implications of that on the Jewish American psyche. Can you talk a little bit about what you think the risks are of that mentality? So I think it's a great question. First of all, thank you. Uh, Al Tribble, who's our security director in Houston, is phenomenal. Um, and doing exactly that, that work. And one of the programs Al has worked on is how we bring young people into the equation in a way that empowers them. And I think that that is the answer to the question. Fear is not a motivator. Fear is a, it, is, it, it, it freezes you, right? And there are far too many organizations out in the world, and certainly in our community, that are all too happy to instill fear for whatever their motivation is or whatever their, their desire is. I don't think it works in the long term. I think it creates a mindset of everyone's out to get me. What I don't think does that is empowering people to do work. And if I go back to the fire safety example, right, I could get up in front of any room and talk to people about what would happen in a building fire. Or I could bring a fire marshal in to do it. And guess what? We would scare the living daylights out of everybody, right? Because it is a horrendous, awful outcome. But we don't do that. We provide skill sets to people. Stop, drop, and roll, feel the back of the door, crawl, call 911. We empower people with information and knowledge. And I find that to be the solution. And I, I don't often share it, but I will share one personal story with you all. All of you who are from Chicago will remember July 4th. Uh, several years ago, we had a mass attack in Highland Park. Probably all of you have heard about it. So my, my nine-year-old was seven at the time. And her and her mother were at the parade. I happened to be working that day. And 10.13 um, in the morning, my ex-wife called and 
said, we're okay. And I said, what are you talking about? She said, we're at the parade. And aside, I had told her not to go to the parade, which, you know, <laughs> whole other story about that. But um, I said, put Alex on the phone. Alex was my daughter. Alex was seven. I said, Alex, are you okay? She said, Daddy, there was a bad man. There was a lot of noise. People started to run. I grabbed her, my cousin, and we ran. I said, how'd you know what to do? That was a leading question from the lawyer. <laughs> Harvard taught me a little bit. Maybe I agree with most of the comments about Harvard, but I did learn that. Leading questions. So, Abba, you taught me. That kid had never been in actual training. She had sat through so many Zoom presentations during COVID, though, that she had intaken the information. We also play a game. We play the what-if game. When we go into a Starbucks, I say, what if something happened? Where would you go? She and her older sister, who is 16, have learned from an early age that their heads are on a swivel. They learn to look for exits. They learn to how many cars are in the parking lot, how many people are in the And you make a game out of it. And I call it the what if game, right? That is putting them in a position to succeed when something happens and it is empowering. And it puts them to move. And if we think back to October 7th, right? In the midst of all the chaos and the carnage, think about what Israelis did. They moved, they committed to action. Some without weapons, some without shoes, they moved towards the fight. And when the sirens go off in Israel from the earliest of ages, do the kids freeze? Are they frightened? Possibly. But they also have a toolkit to pull from so they know what to do. And that is the difference. And to break it down the most simple, if you've ever been to dinner and somebody starts choking, it's the difference between being scared out of your mind and not knowing what to do versus knowing how to do the Heimlich maneuver and having a toolkit to play on. And that's exactly what we are doing. And the investment we are making, if you think back, the investment we are making in security is the down payment on a Jewish future. We are so good at collectively organizing. In the days after October 7th, our community came together and raised what is now over $850 million. That's impressive, it is amazing. How much would you have invested on October 6th though if we could have prevented it? Right? That's what we're making the investment for. It's a tail end from there. Um, college campuses, you touched upon them, but obviously it's kind of a big concern near and dear to me. And um, everybody here in the room, we've got kids, we've got grandkids, we've got great grandkids. We've got kids who are going to end up on college campuses in a few years, and kids who have been there during the last year. What, what do you see, what do you do next in your, from behind your desk, in your role, to try to fix the mess that our college campuses have become? And thank you for such a small question. Um, so one, I have to be cognizant of what, what, is, what is ours to do, but let me tell you what we're doing in the short term and then what I think needs to happen in the long term. So in the short term, if we go back to what I mentioned about law enforcement, in the next four weeks, we are convening in Washington, D.C., what is known as the Major City Chiefs Association. That is the 65 largest police chief, police departments in the country. Their representatives, along with the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the International Association of Campus Law Enforcement. We are working to provide law enforcement the tools and policies and procedures that they are asking for, that they are not getting from their campus administrators, so that they can be empowered to do their job and to create a coalition along with federal law enforcement so that they can do it. While at the same time, we are working with other organizations to advocate for policy changes that I, I can't even say that they make sense. Not doing them is ridiculous, right? Demasking policies. That we do not allow people to be masked on college campuses. We don't allow people to be masked in public protests. Simple solutions. 
in the long term, in the long term, there's a variety of things. On the security side, so my wheelhouse, right? We have got to invest in Jewish security with communal organizations. People will not show up if they don't feel safe. And we will, the first time that somebody decides not to go to shul, send their kids to college, or send their kids to Jewish summer camp because of security, we will have handed our adversaries and the terrorists a victory that we, they could never achieve on their own. So it's investing in the security through SCN, with our partnerships with Hillel, with our partnerships with the security or the synagogue movements, the groups on campus. Longer term though, look at what's happening on our campus environment. So there's a reason why we don't allow foreign ownership of the press in this country, right? Now you, we can all have probably a very fun discussion about our feelings about journalism and the state of journalism in this country, depending on where people are, I'm mean, apolitical, but the, Reality is we have prohibited foreign ownership of the press so that we don't have foreign influence. So what if countries, perhaps maybe strategic allies, but don't necessarily share our values or our long-term interests, what have they figured out? Instead of buying the paper, I'll just buy the editorial room. And how do I do that? I invest in education on college campuses. So if we wanna get serious about the long-term problem, it's changing the thought processes and the teaching that's going on in those universities. And that is a bigger issue than the security, and that is a community-wide issue. But on the security side, we need to make sure law enforcement is empowered to do their jobs, and that we have campus administrators who understand the security impacts when any student feels unsafe. And I challenge anyone to let me know what other community would have to tolerate what we're putting up with. What other community would tolerate or be, it would be tolerated for calls for genocide against their students, African-American, Latino, LGBTQ+, whatever it would be, who would be forced to look at those encampments and calls for genocide but us? That double standard needs to cease to exist. What, your group, what do you do with, in the states, working with the states and the federal government, and what pushback do you get negative from states, governors, and the federal so the work that we do with uh, the federal government, I'll start there, is in on intelligence and information sharing on a daily basis with our federal law enforcement and intelligence partners. I'll also state that we have been broad in our thought process, so we have a very strong partnership with a number of our um, colleagues in the state of Israel on intelligence and information sharing. We also do an incredible amount of education work so for instance, the tools that law enforcement and that we require for our command center, we, add, we educate our elected representatives on. So two examples that are particularly important. FISA 702 reauthorization. So for everyone, what is FISA? That is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That is what allows our intelligence services to target non-citizens of the United States who are seeking to commit terrorist acts against our country. Dina Weiss, who's our assistant director, leads our policy efforts. We were incredibly active in working to make sure that FISA 702 was reauthorized. We are right now dealing with a Privacy Rights Act, which seeks to strip law enforcement of its ability to identify bad actors. That includes individuals, foreign actors and domestic actors. It will make it more difficult for local and state law enforcement to identify offenders at pro-Hamas rallies. And so we are working to educate policymakers on the implications of that. At the same time, we work to make funding available, nonprofit security grant funding available that allows doors to be hardened, cameras to be installed. Our budget last year was $21.8 million. We return to the community through those federal grants $28 million. So I like to say that we're a budget positive organization. What pushback have we gotten? And on the state level, the, the partnership is very, very similar. I, I should point that out. Um, the pushback that we've gotten has only been the request for us to do more. So what we can do in our command center, for instance, we can look at social media, we can look at the surface and deep and dark web. 
Those are things that when I served in law enforcement or when one of our 75 security directors ranging in rank from the assistant directors of the FBI to local police officers who serve on our team, any one of us would have needed to have probable cause and a search warrant to do the work that we can do uninhibited at SCN. And so we are predicating investigations and handing them over to law enforcement. And so what we've heard consistently from law enforcement is not pushback, it has been a plea for us to be able to do more because we are helping them to better identify targets, investigate them, arrest them, and then prosecute them and get them off the streets. Jackie Schiff, ladies and gentlemen, please, a round of applause. As a practical example, there's a convention coming up in Chicago. So what types of things would your organization be involved in to prevent things from getting out of hand? So there are some things I can talk about, and there are some things I can't talk about. What I will talk about is, so first of all, uh, just for context, this is the first set of conventions in United States history that one Secret Service field office has the pleasure of dealing with both conventions. Um, that was bad planning. Uh, not on the Secret Service's part, by the way. So interestingly, what have we have been doing? Um, we have, earlier this week, or last week, I'm sorry, we had a joint meeting with the United States Secret Service uh, to identify potential threats and coordinate with them on intelligence and information sharing. As I think it was said in my bio, I serve on the executive board of the Joint Terrorism Task Force in Chicago. So there's a lot of coordination around intelligence and information sharing, much of which is going on in our command center to identify and highlight bad actors or those that we know may be coming to either convention. And very interestingly, for the purposes of, of this group and our off the record friendly, I usually call it a Cohen of silence, um, but a Cohen of silence. One of the things that we have seen in the threat dynamic for the majority of the planning process of these special events, the focus was on the RNC in Milwaukee because of the feeling of who was gonna show up uh, to protest the RNC. Post 10-7, that planning calculation flipped on its head to be the DNC because of the feeling of what was gonna show up to the city. And um, we have political leadership that is objectively sympathetic and I can say that because our mayor cast the, cast the deciding vote in voting for a ceasefire resolution, not my mayor, but the mayor. Uh, so I think that is contributing to the threat dynamic. So there's a lot of pre-planning going on. There's a lot of coordination with the US Capitol Police, elected officials, particularly Jewish members of Congress and elected officials on their own security. Um, it is going to be a very interesting couple of days. Michael. Um, Maybe mention where you have presence around the country, because I think that'd also be an interesting topic. Thanks, Rob. So we are structured very similarly to the FBI um, in our organization. So our national headquarters is in Chicago. That's where the command center is. We have 11 regional offices around the country. We divide the country into 11 regions, and we have a regional director in each one of them. We then work in partnership with all of our federations, but with an, about half of them, we have very special relationships like here in Jewish Colorado, uh, where the security director is employed by SCN for a host of liability reasons and issues, and also so that we can um, ensure that they are getting the best support they can from a security perspective, but they report directly to the federation executive um, and articulate and undertake the objectives and priorities of the local community. We still have, though, too many rural and underserved communities that aren't protected from security coverage. And I, when I took this job six years ago, December 4th, 2017, which was the day the Capitol moved to Jerusalem, was my first day on the job. It was a very interesting first day. Um, one of the things that we would say as a Jewish community, at that time, there were 19 security professionals working on behalf of the Jewish community. And those were in our 19 largest Jewish communities other than New York, which was not included at the time. And the community leadership would sort of pat itself on the back and say, we've got 19 security directors. Now, remember, I went to the Marine Corps and was in law school, so math is not my strong suit. 
But we have 450 Jewish communities around the United States and over 12,500 facilities. So even in my very simple Marine Corps brain math, 19 out of 450, really bad percentage. And so it has been a huge priority for us to work to build that iron dome across the whole country and ensure that every community has the coverage. Because I go back to that collective actioning, how effective we are when we come together, our adversaries know that. And it, while it can be a strength in certain situations when there's a war in Israel, for instance, it can also be an incredible vulnerability because they know they only have to get one Jew in one place. And it doesn't matter if it's in Haifa or Herzliya or you know Montana. And that is the reality of why we need to build that security dome over the entire country. So I would ask you, please grab one of us. Grab Dina, grab Amanda who's sitting in the back, we'll all wave. Ask us about whether your community, other than here, because you're covered by the Phenomenal Federation, I wanna recognize Jonathan Perlmutter, who is the uh, chair of the Security Committee for Jewish Colorado as well. Ask us, is my community covered? And we will work with you. We will work with the community to make sure that you've got security coverage, because we are not gonna choose the time and place. So more resources. So we just, we just, that's the simple answer. We've been building this plane while we've been flying it. And, you know, I, for those communities that have made the investment, we teach our kids all the time in our liturgy, when did Noah build the ark? Before it began to rain, right? We have seen those communities that have made the investment, like here in Colorado, have been better prepared for when the rain is coming and we're in a monsoon. What we need to finish that equation are additional resources. We just completed a study with Boston Consulting Group. Our budget right now, as I mentioned, is $21.8 million. For us to build out that, that Iron Dome across the US, it's gonna cost us about 42, which when we think about how much it, we raise and spend in our community to ensure every Jew is protected, it's a pittance. And I go back to my comment about insurance. Nobody, well, maybe some of you, I don't, enjoys paying their premium for their car insurance but you can't pay for it the day after the accident. This is the insurance that we're putting down for the Jewish future. Got time for one more? Yeah, one more. One more. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we have a grandson at a major university that's had a lot of problems with anti-Semitism. Uh, Hillel and Chabad, my, my grandson's very active in both organizations, and they're doing what they can to increase the security. But the Jewish president of that university is doing nothing. How do you, how do you deal with that? Um, how do you convert somebody who's Jewish with a Holocaust background to secure the university? Because my grandson is not very happy about what's going on, and there are times when he's harassed going to class, and it's not necessary. It shouldn't be. How do you deal with that, with a president who's ineffective? I think it's a great question. It's not a security question, but it's a great question. Um, I was talking to somebody who I have a lot of respect for that has served in elected office for a number of years, as a mayor of a major city, and he made the point, the job that a lot of our campus administrators were hired for is not the job they actually have to do in terms of leading a multi-million, often multi-billion dollar business that is responsible for protecting and securing life. And the reality is that means that the shareholders of the company, which are the students and the parents and the alumni, need to speak with one voice of what they are or are not gonna tolerate. And I have not very much patience for when people, and I like when some of our strongest community advocates, when Bob Kraft decides to pull $25 million from Columbia and people say that's so unfair that he did that, he earned every single one of those dollars and he can direct it wherever the hell he wants to. And he should be able to speak. 
And the same with others in the community. And we have to speak with that voice of where we're going to invest our dollars. And I think we invest in the places that are willing. You saw other campuses like Brandeis and others that have handled it and invited Jewish students onto the campus and said, we welcome you with open arms. Now, I have conflicting feelings about that because I think we need to stand and fight. So I think we need to stand and fight with our dollars and our voice. We are an influential part of the community. And I don't care that our adversaries, are they say that as a hit on us. Well, the Jews have too much power. We've worked for what we've gotten in this country, and we should exercise the power we have to protect Jewish life, and they need to know what we're going to do. So I'm going to note, I just want to reiterate, Dina raised a hand. Amanda, Michael, and a few members of this executive team are in Aspen for another two days. If you're interested in learning more, please go up to one of them. And thank you so much, Michael. Thank you.